the first Muslim was not a man, but a woman. Well, of course, I mean the first after the Prophet himself, and this was Khadija bin Khuwaylid, his wife at the time of 15 years. Khadija's wisdom in recognizing his prophetic calling, her devotion to and faith in the Prophet, went unmatched. A man who she comforted, steadied and wisely counseled at the beginnings of the none too clear path towards the fulfillment of revelation. And in recognition and appreciation of his remarkable wife, the Prophet would assign her with the most honored of tributes, as the first lady in Islam, in the here and the hereafter. And in recounting the Sirah and Nabawiya, the biography of the Prophet, what is clearly apparent at the outset was how more women accepted the Islamic message and faith than did the males of the Meccan society. And with this fact was the reality that women played a more involved role in the beginnings of the faith. In receiving religious instruction and ultimately more time spent in companionship with the Prophet, and in consequence, a large contingent of women in early Islam became expert oral reciters of the Qur'an, as well as were accurately versed in the great number of hadiths of the Prophet that would be relayed in their name. Another label that would be attributed to a woman in Islam would be as the first martyr. And she was Sumayya bin Khubat, who endured persecution and torture rather than succumb to the denial of her new faith. But what one should also recognize is that women in Islam, and especially during its first decades, took an active role across a wide spectrum of life, political, economic, social, and so on. And also quite significantly in the conquests that saw the expansion of the faith across the Arabian Peninsula and greater region. The warrior women of Islam were many, Many fought in skirmishes, battles, and full-fledged wars. Most of the time, it was unbeknownst to those on the battlefields whether this was indeed a woman at all, as they wore the same military attire as the men, sheathed behind their scarves, hiding their identities. So who we know of are not as many as the potential reality, but we will explore those that are clearly identified within the Islamic history books. Umm Hakim bint al-Harith ibn Hisham was a companion of the Prophet and later on became the wife of Umar bin al-Khattab, the second Rashidun Caliph. Umm Hakim, as part of the Quraysh tribe, was coincidentally a participant in the early Islamic wars for both sides of the conflict. Initially at the Battle of Uhud in 625 and prior to her submission to Islam, Umm Hakim led a group of Quraysh women into battle as drumbeaters, a battle that saw a great setback and defeat for the Muslims. While in 634, during the Battle of Marj al-Safar against the Byzantines in the Siege of Damascus, Umm Hakim's heroism in this battle was reflected in the substantial damage both she and the Muslims inflicted upon their enemy. Umm Hakim, by killing seven Byzantine soldiers and by the Muslims, winning the battle and soon thereafter in conquering Damascus. Nusayba bin Takap, better known as Umm Amara, was one of the earliest female converts to Islam and a companion of the Prophet. Her strong commitment to her new faith saw her become a leading educator of the religion amongst the women of Medina. As battles began to rage between the Muslims and the incumbent Meccan power, the Al Quraysh tribe, Umm Amara would see her enthusiasm for defending the faith lead to her presence at the Battle of Uhud. Initially, Umm Amara's role was to provide water and comfort to the wounded. But as events turned against the Muslims, she found herself alongside the Prophet and a few of his companions, outnumbered and surrounded by the enemy. Umm Amara fought gallantly, was injured repeatedly, yet helped protect the Prophet from the attacks of the Quraysh. She would end up with 13 wounds total, and within a year, Umm Amara was back in action with the Muslim army. Khawla bint al-Azwar was the sister of the famous Dharar ibn al-Azwar, a military leader and veteran within General Khalid ibn al-Walid's army. Khawla is considered one of the greatest female soldiers in history. Not much detail is known about her warrior life, except that she was highly skilled in fighting with the spear, the sword, and martial arts, all ingrained in her during her youth by her brother Zarar. Khawla's involvement with the conquest started during the conquest of Syria, with the Battle of Thaniyat al-Uqab in 634, where she was part of a successful mission to free her imprisoned brother Zarar from the Byzantines, followed by the Battle of Ajnadin in the same year, when Khawla was again in the midst of the bloody action. While fully dressed as an Arabian knight, she would relentlessly charge at the enemy. Many assumed that this warrior was indeed Khalid ibn al-Walid, 
due to the ferocity of her fighting and her defense of many Muslims on the battlefield. One commander of the Rashidun army was quoted as saying, This warrior fights like Khalid ibn al-Walid, but I am sure he is not Khalid. No, not Khalid, but Khawla. Women's involvement didn't rest with the fighting roles on the battlefield. Battles also were won many a times through psychological warfare, and women in Islam played this role to the highest levels of aptitude, either through the skill of poetry and taunting, or by the misrepresentation of reality through the use of deception. In the six-day battle of Yarmouk between Muslims and the Byzantines in 636, Muslims were outnumbered by no less than five times, yet eventually won. And what was a major turning point on the second day of engagement was the leadership of Hind bint Utbah, when she recognized the disastrous retreat of the left flank of the Muslim army. And as it was gradually pushed towards the Muslims' camp, without delay, Hind mustered up all the women of the camp, armed themselves with dismantled tent poles, and charged at the retreating Muslim forces, screaming taunting songs at the men, putting into question their manhood. And in turn, the men, between a rock and a hard place, recommenced their fighting against the Byzantines, pushing them back to a standstill for the day, and thereby protecting the integrity of the Muslim force. Tamadr bin Tamr, simply known as al Khansa, was an influential poet prior to Islam as well as beyond it. She was known for her great elegies and odes in memory of the fallen. Upon her adoption of Islam, al Khansa would use the power of her words to both encourage and inspire the Muslim armies as they were about to enter battle that would produce dramatically heroic actions on the part of their men. And in parallel, during the fighting, al Khansa would carry on with schemes to taunt the men of the enemy, questioning their chivalry and military prowess. At the Battle of al Qadisiyah in 636, prior to combat, al Khansa would focus her poetic inspiration on her four sons who were part of the Muslim army, guiding them to fight the good fight. As the battle raged on, al Khansa worked extremely hard to keep the Muslim spirits up with her words of wit. The Muslims decisively defeated the Sasanians six days later. All of al Khansa's four sons would be martyred. In 642, during a substantial uprising from the town of Maysan close to the Tigris River, al mughir ibn Shu'bah, the governor of Kufa, took out his army to meet the pagan revolt. Days later, upon the Muslim army departing their encampment in preparation for battle, Azda bint al-Harith ibn Kelda became aware that there was nothing between the Muslim camp and the enemy should the Muslims lose. Azda wanted to avoid a fate of slavery and servitude, summoned all the women of the camp and led them to join the Muslim army. Not in actual battle, but by fabricating great numbers of army banners, mimicking the presence of reinforcements. As the army of women marched towards the battle scene, with their numerous banners in hand and the resultant immense clouds of dust, such a scene gave an impression of a large Muslim boost of strength. The army was in total disbelief and became totally demoralized. The uprising was quelled. As history progressed from the early age of Islam, women and their role in written history appears to diminish. Of course, the females of the Ahl al-Bayt, the Prophet's progeny, were resilient in their presence in the history books and in the memory of believers. They were far too important and integral to the religion to be diminished. Whereas the rest of women, those who projected female strength and ability in the support of Islam, as it grew century after century, saw a gradual decline in their recognition, recollection, and in the preservation of their stories. To the extent that some of the women mentioned previously, today are not considered real or factual, but are considered within the realm of myth and legend. Many claims by many subsequent Muslim scholars and historians injected doubt into their existence. Why? Well, it was clear during the era of the Rashidun Caliphates that Islam, as the new religion, fed in line with the existing faiths and societal traditions of the time, with its full assimilation of the way of patriarchy. Islam appears to be a more egalitarian religion when it comes to women back in the day of the Prophet. Not in the absolute sense that what each could do was equal to that of the other gender, but in how women at the time of need operated as would any man, in the open, in battle, and in danger. Islam as a community definitely practiced modesty in that day and age, but was also a community that valued every member, male or female, and what they could offer. Women had a role in every aspect of life. 
Yet, subsequent to the life of the Prophet, this acceptance and openness regressed in a downward trend, undulating between more or less conservatism, and of course, mounting male-centric dominance, till it followed the same model as its preceding Abrahamic faith, Christianity, and how male leadership on both nation and religion fronts carved out a new understanding of how women should operate as members of society. We look to the Prophet, his sayings and actions, to understand how best to be Muslim. Maybe we should look again and reassess his comprehensive lifetime and in his beliefs and wisdoms when dealing with women, not based on a few instances here and there, and how he trusted and respected their abilities across the board. And maybe then we can do away with the many unfavorable attitudes of antiquity towards women we have carried forth to this very day.